good day and uh, blessings on you. And as we uh, turn into the Bible today together and look at uh, a really fantastic uh, chapter in 1 Timothy, I'm going to just give you a little heads up. This one, this particular message will be um, sound, at least a little teachy. And, and I hope that doesn't uh, distract you. I would recommend a pen and a piece of paper, or maybe you have a great memory. It's okay, well, however you want to handle that. But thank you so much, once again, to invite me on behalf of Redwater Alliance into your homes. I am very grateful. We are very grateful. They're obviously not here with me right now. And I thank you so much for your kindness and your... your, and, your and for those who make comments... Uh, A few of you have responded uh, positively, and I thank you so much. That is quite an encouragement, and I appreciate it. So I want to begin with a a question. Maybe you've talked about this subject. Maybe you've studied it. Maybe you are actually teach it or or, or whatever. Uh, The question is, what is leadership? And if someone asks you to define leadership, how would you respond? And leadership... Very, very interestingly, interestingly, has been studied and analyzed, and defined and written about, quoted, taught, argued, lived out, talked about, and on and on throughout all the ages. And if you just spend 10 minutes searching for the go-to book on leadership, you will find many books written by many, many authors who present many definitions and qualities and characteristics of a leader. It seems that leadership is hard to pin down in, in the books. And there are many people today who are considered great teachers of leaders in every area and discipline of leadership. John Maxwell, for example, who is an influencer and teacher of leadership, said that a leader is, quote, one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. Former U.S. President Ronald Reagan said, quote, the greatest leader is not necessarily the one who does the greatest things. He's the one that gets the people to do the greatest things. Further back, the the 26th U.S. President, Theodore Roosevelt, said, quote, speak softly and carry a big stick. You will go far. The 4th century gave us this quote from Alexander the Great. Quote, I'm not afraid of an army of lions led by a sheep. I am afraid of an army of sheep led by a lion. What about the 21st century? What have, what, have, what have been said about leadership in the 21st century? Someone said 21st century leadership is about empowerment and not control. Someone else said that, that the best leaders are the ones who lead by example. Indeed, leadership is, in its own way, an immense reality which has had a great impact in every aspect of society arts, education, politics, business, economics, and religion. And just in case I missed anything, I repeat that leadership has impacted every facet of society throughout all of human history. And really, to add to the immensity of this subject, we haven't even scratched the surface concerning the qualities and the characteristics and the qualifications of leaders. Our current series here at Redwater Alliance is called What is the Church? So this will be our focus when we consider leadership and leaders today. And in order to prime the pump and get the juices flowing, let me share a statement concerning church leadership by Pastor John MacArthur, where he said the leadership role is a spiritual responsibility and the people we lead are a stewardship from God for which we will one day be called to give an account. Please turn in your Bibles or on your, in your apps or iPads or whatever you're using to 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3, and we're going to work, uh, read from 1 through 7 together. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. 
He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. Verse 5, if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you again as we meet in this format, online, via video. We thank you, Lord, for the technology that we can do this and we can be together, at least in this way, during these challenging times over the last couple of years. We pray, Lord, uh, that you would help us by your spirit to understand uh, these these, uh, seven verses in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy. Help us understand the roles of men and women in the church. We will not be able, O Lord, to deal with this uh, exhaustively, here in 25, 30 minutes. But Lord, will you help us by your spirit to have a open heart and a, and a gentle spirit to, to listen to your word and ask you to help us uh, understand and process these things that you are instructing us from your, from your inspired and authoritative word. And we thank you, Lord, for your kindness in our life. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for our families and our friends. And we ask, Lord God, that you would just be honored and worshipped in this way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, uh, we closed off chapter 1 of Paul's letter. And it would be profitable for us to summarize where we've gone so far. So answering the question, what is the church? We have discovered that the church was created by God for God, for his purposes, and second, for his called people, for his people. See, God didn't create religion. He didn't create denominations, and he certainly didn't create buildings. He created the church, which represents him on earth. And those he calls, we learned, he has saved to serve. First and foremost, to serve his son, Jesus Christ, and from there, flowing from there, serving others. And those he calls are the ones that have been saved by placing their faith in the one and only Son of God, Jesus Christ. For Paul said, Christ Jesus, in this letter he said, for Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That is, one is saved by grace through faith alone, not by works, but by the life, death, burial and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. In summation, the church belongs to God who created it. His children were saved to serve by placing their faith in Jesus Christ alone. Also, if you've been tracking in this series, you may have noticed that we have moved from chapter 1 straight to chapter 3. And if you know anything about chapter 3, you may have noticed that it contains some provocative teaching of Paul's concerning the roles of of men and women in the church. And why is this provocative? Because of our current cultural climate. It is very contentious, uh, this teaching in our climate, current current climate. Rest assured, I'm not skipping chapter 2. We will not be skipping chapter 2. I have no objection, personally, to ruffle someone's feathers or sensibility concerning biblical theology. I can only say that we will find greater clarity by the time we conclude Two and three. And we also need to realize that chapter three should not be taken alone. It should not be independent from chapter two. For chapter two to chapter three, verse 16, are to be taken as one unit, one literary unit. For in order to fully grasp the biblical teaching that Paul is relating to Timothy, requires one to understand the whole context, the whole piece. Looking at verse 1 to 16, we see here that Paul provides his apostolic teaching concerning the qualifications of an elder and a deacon in the local church. And in his case, specifically concerning the Ephesian church that Timothy was to deal with. And when we consider these guidelines that we have here in verse 1 through 7, we should, as one commentator pointed out, Keep in mind the general nature of Paul's instructions to Timothy and to us today. 
In other words, Paul's teaching concerning church leadership goes beyond the immediate context Paul was addressing in Ephesus. For friends, God's word is authoritative and instructive of the things of God in all times and all places and context. So this teaching here, these instructions here, are beyond uh, time in a way. Contextually, we see that Paul was addressing the leadership concerns in Ephesus. Possibly there were elders that needed to be replaced for a variety of potential reasons. One cannot be certain, but as there was disorder in the church caused by false teaching, no doubt some of those roads led to elders who were ultimately responsible for the doctrine and teaching of the church. If you remember, um, in chapter 1, Paul highlights two heretics, Hymenius and Alexander, who were excommunicated, put out of the church. And later in his letter in chapter 5, Paul, Paul points to the, uh, the charges and how to deal with that against sinning elders in the church. So leadership had to be addressed. And Paul gives Timothy, and also in his letter to Titus, the qualifications of godly leaders, of godly leaders in the church. So we notice together verse 1. Let's read it together. Here's a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. This phrase, whoever aspires, has also been translated, um, if anyone sets his heart. So what does Paul mean? Well, friends, it is a good thing to desire such a role. Such a role. And the translation, sets his heart, brings this across nicely. It is, as Paul said, a noble task, task where we could you know, get the, the meaning out of that original word, a good work. It is a good work to set your desire on. I hopefully you've been tracking with me so far. I've gone too fast for you. Possibly you've stumbled over a few words in the text. In your experience, you may have already heard the word overseer or elder and deacons. You may have been a member of another church where they have leaders who are called bishops and archbishops and father or some other title. You may have heard elders also called pastors and pastors also called elders. And there is a potential here for confusion and misunderstanding, especially if one is new to Christianity or a new believer from another faith group or even for some uh, seasoned believers. And we don't need to spend too much time on this. And next week, uh, our focus will be on deacons. So today we're going to just look at the role of overseer, as uh, the text calls it here, overseer. Simply, overseer, friends, can be translated bishop or elder. While each are used in the Bible in various places and circumstances, the biblical evidence indicates, and in the original language as well, indicates that the term uh, terms elder, bishop, overseer, and pastor are synonymous with the spiritual leaders of God's church. So when all this is added up, terminology set aside, um, God has created two formal offices. These are formal offices ordained by God in the church. And we see the first one in verse 1 to 7 where you could use the word overseer or elder or pastor, and verse 18, 8 to 13, deacon. And for the rest of our time, I'm just going to use the word elder so we don't get confused. Because as I said, elder, uh, overseer, pastor, bishop, they all are pointing to the office of elder. And these are desirable and noble offices to seek after. When we consider the two offices of elder and deacon, the context of the New Testament and Paul's apostolic teaching, and, and as we focus on the office of elder, these leadership roles for elder, as Paul teaches here in the church, are for men, are reserved for men. Now, as we mentioned in our current cultural context, this statement will not be received favorably and likely labeled sexist or some other other not so nice word, with the majority of people in the West. So when we look at evangelicalism, the church, the, the evangelical, evangelical, I can't even say it anymore, pardon me, evangelicalism, 
we will find differing opinions and practices in regard to the roles of men and women in the church. I think I've got marbles going on in my mouth. But to help our understanding, we could say that evangelicals fall primarily into two camps, complementarianism or egalitarianism. Now we're going to look at those two from a different angle uh, when we work our way through chapter 2, so we'll get a fuller picture, we'll connect some dots there. But in brief for today, complementarianism is the teaching that masculinity and femininity are ordained by God. And to quote one commentator, Men and women are created to complement or complete each other. And the gender roles found in the Bible when applied in the home and the church are purposeful and meaningful distinctions. Now, egalitarianism, in its broadest sense, understands that all people are inherently equal, therefore should be treated as such. In our text, Paul is dealing with doctrinal teaching concerning church leadership. So we appeal again to the same commentator regarding uh, egalitarianism. Quote, egalitarianism has a narrow meaning that's in the context of the church, suggesting that God does not intend any distinctions between men and women in matter of spiritual leadership. All people are morally and spiritually equal, with identical value and ought to be offered the same opportunities. As was mentioned, we we will come around to this important matter, because it matters, when we work our way through chapter 2 and we'll connect all the dots with chapter 3. But just in case one might think that someone who supports uh, complementarianism is a chauvinist, is bigoted, biblical complementarianism does not promote any stereotype such as the idea that wives should be homebound, barefoot, pregnant, powerless, and ignored. That's not found anywhere in the Bible. Nor does biblical complementarian view designate differences for men and women in the workplace. The Bible supports egalitarianism when treating men and women uh, as equally proficient and respected persons. The bottom line really, folks, is in regard to biblical complementarian view is where egalitarian practices in the church eliminate all distinctions between the sexes. And these views are not considered biblical. So now we're moving into uh, verse 2 to 7. Here in verse 2, you will find seven qualifications that mark the noble office of elder. One, above reproach. Two, faithful to his wife. Three, temperate. Four, self-controlled. Five, respectable. Six, hospitable. Seven, able to teach. And it's interesting to note that Paul began his list with above reproach. If you go back in chapter 1, verse 6 and 8, Paul there describes the false teachers in Ephesus. Paul said they had departed from the goal of all believers. And what is the goal of all believers? Well, Paul said it is love which comes from a pure heart and a sincere conscience and a sincere faith. A good conscience, pardon me, and a sincere faith. Those that God calls to fill the noble office of elder are to be above reproach. That is, nothing can be charged against them other than love, a pure heart, and a good conscience and a sincere faith. See, these spiritual leaders of the church pursue righteousness. Whereas Paul said in his second letter to Timothy, pursue, flee the evil desires of youth, but Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. So elders must be above reproach. And in case we've forgotten, this is God's desire for all his people to be above reproach. Why? Well, the Bible tells us that no one may be open to blame. So that no one may be open to blame. Yes, the outside is looking in and wondering what's going on. With this virtue leading the way, this above reproach, we can quickly move through the rest. Next, the elder is faithful to his wife. This can also be translated in other uh, reliable translations, the husband of one wife, such as in NASB. The Greek literally here means one woman man. But the NIV really captures the heart of this virtue. Elders are faithful to their wives in word, 
thought and deed. They're faithful to their wives in word, thought and deed in the home and when away from the family as well, whether they're in the church or on a holiday or on a work trip or going to school or on a whatever. They're faithful. Now, we need to just say one thing about singleness. Does this exclude single men from this office? Short answer is no. Moving on, the next two we can include together, temperate and self-controlled. These qualities, qualities of the elder are the opposite of the negative traits we find that Paul has in verse 3, who Paul calls not violent and not quarrelsome. See, even elders and even all people, God desires all believers to live out these virtues of temperate and self-controlled. Paul said to Titus, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. This is something we should heed in our present age. Next, we can put together respectable and hospitable. Again, these are directly opposite to the negative traits found in verse 3. Respectable, my friends, when one is respectful, respectful, respectable, it is the result of an inward character and integrity of that elder. Inward character and integrity are key here. The original Greek, and then we look at hospitable, this does not mean that one likes to entertain or one desires to entertain. The original Greek compo, compound word here means love of stranger. The elder pastor, by his godly example, by his integrity and character, practices hospital, hospitality and shares with those in need. This is a, a very important uh, qualification of an elder. Last on Paul's list in verse 2, the elder must be able to teach. And it's important to note, if you were to read through 8 through 12, that this qualification, this, this quality that an elder must possess is not included for deacons. The expositor's New Testament commentary helps us here. Quote, Paul indicates that teaching, along with the authority to do so, is a special function and responsibility of the elder. Now, this function, my friends, and responsibility are what sets the elder apart from all other leadership roles in the local church. You know, when we consider today the potential uh, consequences and fallout of false teachers and other kinds of unbiblical teaching and worldviews can impact a local church, the office of elder, the ordained office of elder, and the special function and responsibility of that elder to teach the full counsel of God's Holy Bible is essential. It's not an option. It's essential. Now we could talk about learning how to do that, but here this quality tells us it's essential. In addition, as we consider our current cultural reality in the evangelical world, there is pressure in the evangelical church is for the elder to do anything else other than teach to do anything else other than teach. Someone said about this, quote, simply put the idea of pastor elders being savvy decision makers, but not teachers is foreign to the New Testament, including the concept of ministry specialized pastors. Bottom line, folks, while there are those who are spiritually gifted in the local church and are blessing, a great blessing to church, they would not be considered qualified elders unless they are able to teach. That's a gift that God gives the elder. Verse 3, Paul represents, as I said earlier, four negative traits. And we'll just sort of summarize this and say that these characteristics, these characteristics in, in verse 3, any one of them alone would disqualify someone from serving in any leadership position in the church, let alone elder any leadership position. Someone said, quote, a drunk, violent, combative, and greedy man is the exact opposite of what an overseer ought to be, end quote. Looking at verse 4 and 5, we can understand these verses in this sense. 
See, when the man seeks the noble office of elder, how they lead their family at home, how they relate to their family, how they treat their family when the, the doors are closed to the outside world, how they treat their family outside of the home, how they lead their family outside of the home, speaks volumes about the character and integrity of the man. There are some experts out there, some men out there, some people out there that are experts in presenting this public image of godliness and hiding a home life behind closed doors that is quite the opposite. You see, an elder must be transparent in his public ministry, must, in his spiritual leadership at home, transparent in every aspect of his, uh, of his public ministry, his handling of finances, handling of the word of God, his theology, every aspect, how, how he handles conflict, every aspect of his public ministry must be transparent and his spiritual leadership at home as well. And, as, and the proof, as is often said, is in the pudding. It will be evident with the spouse, with his spouse and children. For if an elder cannot manage his own family, Paul says, says how can he take care of God's family, the church? Last but not least, we have verse 6 and 7. Let's read that, uh, these two verses together. He must, not, he must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Friends, this speaks to the, necessary, the necessity of spiritual maturity required of the elder. And it's not specifically about their age, it's about their spiritual maturity. And we must remember, while Paul gives us these qualifications here in his letter, God is always concerned for, with all, his, all people with the inside, the heart and the mind of the person, of the believer especially. And for those who are called to the office of elder, spiritual maturity is essential. Well, time is not on our side, so we can just wrap this idea up by saying that the best guard against pride is spiritual maturity. For God said, for God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Now, while spiritual maturity is essential for the elder, so is a good reputation with those outside the church. This is one area, absolutely one area, that an elder must guard. For this has caused many church leaders to leave the ministry in disgrace. Basically, this is about integrity and character. It's about trust and faith in Christ. Is the elder the same outside the church walls as he's inside the church? Is he the same outside and inside? Everywhere outside and everywhere inside. If not, Paul said there's a greater possibility of falling into disgrace and into the devil's trap. I would love to give you some illustrations, but time is not on my hand in our, in our favor, I mean. And if this were to happen, if this disgrace were to befall an elder, it would not only impact the elder and his family, but the church in which these elders represent in the community. Now, there's a lot of ways we can summarize all this. A, like I said, there's a lot of teachy stuff here, but it's a really important, really important to understand God's ordained office of elder and deacon. But so to tie this all up in summary, I want to share with you the words of Pastor O.S. Hawkins, where he said, The pastor has been given by the Sovereign Lord the highest calling in God's economy. It is not a vocation to be chosen among several options. It is a divine, supernatural calling from the Lord. The pastor has a special calling from God and a special gift that is given to him in order to perform the work of the ministry. There is something supernatural about the God-called pastor. Or elder, same thing. Let us pray, folks. Oh, Lord, thank you so much. This is a lot of, a lot, a lot of material to deal with. It's a lot of instruction here, but at the very core, at the very center of it all, for all of us who call themselves followers of Christ, is the heart and mind 
That is the mind and heart that's been changed by grace through faith alone, by the sacrifice of Christ on the, on the cross, and indwelling Holy Spirit who day by day matures us and matures us and grows us and from, from glory to glory to become more like your Son, Jesus Christ. That is, that is the goal. That is the journey all believers in Christ are on. And the local church is indeed, O Lord, your representation on earth. And may it be holy as you are holy. May it be kind as you are kind. May it be just as you are just. And may it be um, teaching the whole counsel of your word while you reveal yourself, your will for us, and how we're to interact with you. I thank you, Lord, that there are many who are maybe hearing this that are not in the family of God. And I pray for them, Lord. I lift them up to you, Lord, and I pray, God, that you would help them and bring them this direction into your family, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all these things in Jesus' name. Thank you so much again for inviting me into your home. Take care. Shalom.